Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is Irish American Radicals, The Forgotten Emigrants. This show takes a break from the story of the Norman invasion, which I will return to in the next episode. This week sees St. Patrick's Day festivals all across the world and nowhere more than in the US where immigrant communities celebrate their history. This podcast looks at the forgotten story of one Irish emigrant community, that is, Irish-American radicals, feminists, socialists and trade union organisers. Their Irish-American experience is all too often written out of history, but it's a fascinating story of working-class emigrants struggling to escape the often brutal working conditions in coal mines and factories in the early 20th century. One Sunday afternoon in 1907 in the Bronx, New York, a group of Irish Americans gathered to discuss politics. A mixture of recent immigrants and second generation families, they gathered in the Gurley Flynn household. The Gurley Flynns were in many ways what we might assume a stereotypical Irish American family to be in the early 20th century. The mother, Anne Gurley, was from Galway, while the father, Thomas Flynn, was the son of emigrants from Mayo. The Flynns, like so many others, traced their roots back to rebels in Ireland. Vague stories in Tom's family told the story of his grandfather, Paddy the Rebel, who had supposedly participated in the 1798 rebellion. More recently, his father had fled Ireland after attacking his landlord's property. Whether true or not, these stories illustrate a deep sense of identity many emigrants felt with Ireland. However, the topic of conversation in the House in 1907 was not what we often associate with Irish Americans. The purpose of the meeting was to form an Irish socialist group in the Bronx. Discussions around socialism were not unusual in the Gurdy Flynn household. Anne was a feminist and Tom an anti-imperialist socialist who had opposed the US war on Cuba in 1898. Clearly, not all Irish Americans were like Tom Flynn or Anne Gurley. Indeed, one of the incidents that had led to the meeting in 1907 was a statement from the Irish-American mayor of New York, George B. McClellan, who had proclaimed proudly, There are Russian socialists, Jewish socialists, German socialists, but thank God there are no Irish socialists. What McClellan did not realise was that while there may not have been an Irish socialist group, many Irish-Americans held left-wing beliefs. It was partially in reaction to McClellan's statement that James Connolly, later executed for leading the 1916 rebellion in Dublin, several members of the Gurley Flynn family, Patrick Quinlan and others gathered to form what became the Irish Socialist Club. Although the club had limited success, its founders went on to provide American unions and left-wing groups with some of their most prolific organisers and leaders. Perhaps the most famous and influential of these organisations being the Industrial Workers of the World. The Industrial Workers of the World, popularly known as the Wobblies, or the Wobs, or the IWW, provided the main pole of attraction for many radicals in America in the first two decades of the 20th century. The IWW was a syndicalist union which was committed to the overthrowing of capitalism by organising all workers into one big union. Among its founding members, there were many of Irish descent, most surprisingly perhaps, a Catholic priest, Father Thomas Haggerty, who was involved in the forming of the Union and articulated its political and philosophical outlook when he wrote the preamble to the 1905 Constitution of the Organisation, which read as follows. The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among the millions of working people and the few who make up the employing class, have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organise as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system and live in harmony with the earth. Instead of the conservative motto of fair day's wage for a fair day's work, we must inscribe on our banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wage system. Little is known about Father Hegarty, but his words would be used time and again to explain the IWW. He himself mysteriously left the organisation almost as soon as it was founded in 1905, never to engage in radical politics again. 
However, it was an Irish woman who became arguably the most famous and feared member of the IWW, Mother Jones, who is celebrated today by a magazine named in her memory. Born Mary Harris in County Cork, she emigrated from Ireland just after the Great Famine of the 1840s. Jones became a political activist in the 1870s after losing all her children to disease and then subsequently losing her business in a fire. Mary got involved in labour organising and by the turn of the 20th century she was known and feared by bosses across the US as a prolific organiser of workers, often in some of the most brutal mining camps where conditions were appalling. Mining bosses treated union organisers brutally and Harris saw this firsthand through her involvement in the Latimer strike in Pennsylvania which saw the police massacre 19 miners in 1897. It was in response to incidents like this that Harris would call for miners to pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. By this stage she was affectionately known as Mother Jones. Her stature was such that in 1905, when initial discussions were held about the formation of what would become the IWW, she was invited to speak. Mother Jones became one of the most active members of the movement for nearly two decades, inspiring a new generation of militants, including a young woman who attended the meeting, forming the Irish Socialist Club in the Bronx in 1907, the daughter of Tom Flynn and Anne Gurley, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. In 1907, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn then only 17, was a full-time organiser for the IWW. In the early 20th century, there were few laws protecting workers or their rights to organise and the IWW launched free speech fights, essentially campaigns over the right to organise workers. This would involve hundreds of organisers, like Elizabeth, turning up in towns and breaking the law, prohibiting their right to organise publicly. They were often attacked and imprisoned. This began what would be a lifetime of activism for Flynn, who would be arrested and imprisoned time and again for her beliefs. For the likes of Flynn and her contemporaries, they saw their commitment to socialism as continuing Irish traditions. Constantly in contact with politics in Ireland, people like Elizabeth very much identified the Irish struggle for independence with the American workers' struggle for better pay and conditions. This thread in American history is long forgotten. However, her father was not alone when he lamented that often Irish people came to America and, I quote, soon became foremen, straw bosses, policemen and politicians and forgot the traditions of the Irish struggle for freedom. Along with their trade unionism, the Irish-American radicals of the early 20th century had a deep commitment to anti-racism. Racism was one of the major obstacles to uniting the American working class. Many working class Irish workers saw themselves as better than African Americans and this led to deep racial tensions which were used by employers to stunt unionisation attempts. The memory of racist draft riots in New York in 1863 when Irish Americans had been to the fore of lynch mobs attacking African Americans reminded people of just how divisive such tensions could be. The IWW, in order to overcome this, were explicitly anti-racist in an era when many unions were not. It was in Philadelphia, one of the largest ports in the eastern US in the early 20th century, that they had their greatest successes, uniting African-American, Eastern European and Irish-American dock workers in what became one of the most famous branches of the IWW. Key to this success was an Irish-American trade union organiser, John Joe McKelvey, who had worked with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the free speech campaigns. His presence and influence helped to overcome the racism that had been prevalent among Irish-American workers. McKelvey worked alongside the African-American longshoreman Ben Fletcher and reaped huge dividends as the IWW effectively controlled the Philadelphia docks between 1913 and 1923, despite constant attempts to subvert their work. The cost of organising for a different vision of America was immense, however. John Joe McKelvey was beaten unconscious by the police in Philadelphia and held without charge during a strike in 1913. It was through struggles like these, though, that a new identity, where being a working-class Irish-American also meant acknowledging the links and common interests that they had with other working-class communities, was forged. While they were committed organisers, they also brought Irish cultural influences to this movement as well, as we shall see next. Irish cultural influences could be seen throughout this radical movement. 
as immigrants joined the ranks of the IWW, they contributed their Irish musical influence on the movement's anthems and songs. Much detail about individual songwriters is now lost, but there are those who we do know a little about. The most famous Irish-American radical songwriter was a man called Dublin Dan Liston, who lived in Butte, Montana. Born in Dublin, Liston owned a bar where many IWW figures drank. He penned the words of the songs Dan McGann and the Portland Revolution. In the lyrics of Dan McGann, Liston challenged prejudices he observed amongst Irish-Americans of the day with the lyrics You howl and kick about the Bolshevik, the anarchist and the wob. You defend this rotten system when you don't even own your own job. Immigration laws would be Jake with you if they kept out the Russian, Finn, the German, Jew and the Frenchman too and just let the Irish in. When Liston died in 1942, his obituary in the newspaper of the IWW, The Industrial Worker, read, He should be remembered for his gift of popularising some of the obscure phrases of his Dublin childhood and giving them worldwide currency. Liston was not the only such songwriter. G.G. Allen, who almost nothing is known about, was either Irish-American or heavily influenced by Irish culture, which was evident in his songwriting. His song, Along the Industrial Road to Freedom, was set to the tune of the famous Irish song, The Rocky Road to Dublin. Another songwriter was Pat Brennan, who wrote a song called Harvest War Song, which he set to the tune of Tipperary. As the IWW grew in stature in the 1910s, it continued to gain more and more traction among the Irish community. In 1912, one of the founders of the Irish Socialist Club in the Bronx, Patrick Quinlan, joined. Born in Limerick in 1883, he had emigrated to the US. When he joined in 1912, the Union had just scored one of its greatest victories, perhaps one of the issues that attracted Patrick Quinlan. That year saw Elizabeth Gurdy Flynn, now a household name, amongst others, organise a successful strike of 20,000 workers in the textile mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts. This victory, known famously as the Bread and Roses Strike, ensured 1913 would be a great year of conflict between factory owners in the US and workers. That year went on to produce one of the bitterest strikes in US history when the IWW took on the silk factory owners at Patterson, New Jersey. It was here that the Limerick man Patrick Quinlan became famous. The strike began on January the 27th when the Doherty Silk Factory fired four members of a workers' organising committee. In response, 800 workers walked off the job in protest. Three weeks later, several thousand workers left other factories to attend a protest meeting addressed by IWW speakers who had been asked to attend. These speakers included Patrick Quinlan, Elizabeth Gardy Flynn, Carlo Tresca, an Italian anarchist, the German-American Adolf Lessig and Big Bill Haywood. Within a week, they had convinced 25,000 silk workers to strike, effectively closing down the silk industry in Patterson. The struggle lasted several months through which the IWW organised kitchens, schools and much of everyday life in Patterson, supported by donations from workers across the US. It was Quinlan though who became the most famed leader when in May 1913 he allegedly told thousands of striking workers that they would win the strike even if it meant wiping Patterson off the map. Quinlan was charged with inciting the strikers to riot and after a prolonged court case he was imprisoned. In response, a large amnesty campaign was organised and he was released two years later in 1915. In the meantime, the strike did not fare well. The IWW had hired Madison Square Garden to stage a pageant to illustrate the case of the strikers to New York workers. However, they did not make the funds they had hoped to in this venture. By late July 1913, the strike was broken due to a lack of money and internal divisions. Nevertheless, Patrick Quinlan went on to become a key figure in left-wing movements in the US for years, being an early visitor to the Soviet Union after the Russian Revolution of 1917. That year of 1913 witnessed another major defeat for workers on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, as 20,000 workers in Dublin were locked out of their employment as employers tried to break their attempts to join unions. This, the famous Dublin lockout, ended in defeat for the workers and resulted in the arrival in the US of another influential immigrant from Ireland, the leader of that lockout, James Larkin. Arriving in New York in spring 1914 unannounced, Larkin went to the Gurley Flynn household in the Bronx, knocking on the door, saying, I'm Jim Larkin, James Connolly sent me. James, known as Big Jim Larkin, joined the IWW and in the following years, 
he became a key figure. 1915 saw perhaps one of the most famous trials in American trade union history when the well-known organiser and singer Joe Hill was convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Innocent of the charges, a global campaign was launched to have the decision overturned. The campaign failed and Hill was executed by firing squad. The sad honour of delivering the funeral oration fell to James Larkin, who spoke to a crowd of about 30,000 workers in Chicago. The execution of Joe Hill ushered in a period of increasing repression and soon Irish Americans were paying a heavy price for their left-wing convictions. In late 1916, another case of false conviction, this time involved an Irish-American man called Tom Mooney. Mooney had been politicised on a trip to Europe when he visited many countries, including Ireland. His experience and exposure to the European trade union movement had a huge influence on him, and on his return to the USA, he joined the IWW and the Socialist Party of America. By 1916, he was a known radical, having organised strikes and demonstrations. After a bomb was thrown at a demonstration supporting US intervention into World War I, Tom was arrested along with his wife and three others. At the end of a highly tense trial, his wife, Rena, and two men, Israel Weinberg and Edward Nolan, were acquitted, but Tom Mooney and Warren Billing were convicted. In what seemed to be a repeat of the Joe Hill case, the two men were sentenced to death. This caused outrage, as strong evidence indicated Mooney's innocence. A large campaign was mounted to free him, and by 1920, incontrovertible evidence emerged proving, beyond doubt, he was innocent. Mooney, however, had the misfortune of being tried and convicted in the run-up to what became known as the First Red Scare, a period of intense repression against left-wing activists that reached a crescendo between 1919 and 1920. This meant he would remain in prison for another 20 years before being finally released and receiving a full pardon in 1939. By 1917, tensions were reaching fever pitch in the US as the country entered World War I. Ardently anti-war, the IWW organised widespread opposition to American involvement in the war. This saw the entire leadership of the Union on the Philadelphia docks removed by federal authority in an effort to stop them organising strikes which would stop military shipments bound for Europe. James Larkin, then editing a newspaper he had founded with Patrick Quinlan in New York, called The Irish Worker, was arrested and charged with criminal anarchy for his involvement in the anti-war activities. Convicted, he was sent to Sing Sing Prison for five to ten years. Although Larkin would secure release in 1923, only to be deported, other Irish Americans were not so lucky as Tom Mooney could have testified. World War I had a profound impact on the world that these people lived in. In 1917, the Russian Revolution occurred as a direct result and its effects were felt around the world. In response to the founding of the Soviet Union in Russia after that revolution, the US government cracked down on its own revolutionaries at home. Under the weight of this repression, the radical movement became increasingly fractured and slipped into decline. Nevertheless, in 1920, a former member of the IWW, Eugene Debs, still garnered nearly one million votes in a US presidential election, despite the fact he was in prison at the time. However, the high point of US radicalism in the early 20th century had passed. Despite this, many Irish Americans still remained committed to socialism for the rest of their lives and were active in radical movements. These experiences in the early 20th century illustrated clearly that there was no one Irish American experience. Class difference created often conflicting views about what America should be within the Irish American community, perhaps best illustrated by the fact that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was indicted by Senator Joseph McCarthy, another Irish American, after World War II in his famous anti-communist witch hunt. All too often, radicals among the Irish American community have been forgotten. Often dubbed as un-American, they themselves strenuously rejected this notion. They saw themselves as much American or Irish American as anyone else. They just held a very different view of what America should be. If you have any opinions on this podcast, let me know at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That email address again is history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Next time I will return with the story of the Norman invasion. I hope you all have a great St. Paddy's Day. Until next time, Sloan. Sloan.